Welcome to Four Quarter Lives, a podcast exploring the profound impact of longer lives and careers on everything, countries, companies, couples, and careers. I'm Aviva Wittenberg-Cox, and on this week's Four Quarter Lives, I talk with Bradley Sherman, founder and CEO of Human Change and author of The Super Age, Decoding Our Demographic Destiny. Bradley is good at getting longevity onto strategic agendas. Before founding his own firm, he spent a decade with AARP in the U.S. as Director of Global Partnerships and Engagements. He helped get longevity and aging as focus areas at the OECD and the World Economic Forum. He also helped launch AARP's Aging Readiness and Competitiveness Report. So big global organizations are all over this. Now Bradley's in the consulting business, and we explore if companies and individuals are getting the message. Bradley Sherman, welcome to Four Quarter Lives. I'm delighted to have you with me. And I'm glad to be with you. Thanks for having me. So we've already been hot on our debate, and I had to push the recording button to you know, stop us talking and open it up. And so we were getting into this first really interesting question of a lot of the debate around longevity kind of goes down two quite different lanes. Do you want to describe what they are for us? Yeah, I mean, lane one is the social part of it and economic part of it, where we are both fully engrossed. And then the other lane is really down science and biohacking and how long can we extend lives and whether or not those lives can be healthy lives. And what I found is that the two sides don't always talk to one another. And I had an opportunity to engage with a number of these folks a few weeks ago in Costa Rica, where I was filming a new docuseries called Reversed the Race for Longevity and really blew me away just how far apart we are in terms of our fundamental understanding of what each side is doing. And what do they think we're doing? And what do we think? Well, I don't, I think that scientists are so focused on a future. These longevity scientists and biohackers are so focused on a future of extending longevity and even healthy longevity that they don't consider the ramifications of what they're doing. So Let's say we extend healthy lives. Let's take, let's take the most altruistic option here. We extend healthy lives by an extra 10 years, but we do nothing to rethink the social contract, how long people are expected to work, nothing to adjust social norms, what our attitudes are towards older adults, particularly in the workforce. We will have exponential growth then of older people living in poverty or in financial insecurity which then puts an additional burden on the state, on the national economy, et cetera. On younger people, on, yeah. Yeah, and so much of this, this science is being, and, I, and it is true science. I, I won't say for all of the biohacking, but, but a lot of this is based in hard science. They're funded by the ultra-rich and by the state. And who's, ben- who's going to benefit at the end of the day? That's really the big question. Now, the, the rich always benefit first from innovation. That's that's a tale as old as time. The question though is how quickly can the rest of us then benefit from these longevity gains? We know society takes a long time to move. And does, on yeah. average, you know, major social change takes about 30 years. And even within our own work around longevity, older adults, demographic change, you know, when the pension was put into place here in the United States, and I would imagine it's the same for Britain, It was 1935, but it took 30 years for people to really accept retirement as a life stage. 30 years. We've got to wait 30 years for the social and economic norms to then catch up to that, which will cause an incredible amount of disruption in the lives of everyday people. But more importantly, the economy. The economy is not going to be able to adjust as quickly as as we want it to. Well, and... I think we could also say we haven't yet digested the longevity gains that we've already made in the 20th century. So as we are observing and working on boomers are the first wave, the very first wave of a new way of aging through already much longer lifespans and health spans. And what, what are they already teaching us about retirement and some of the slow pace of our adjustment to new realities? I think they've taught us that Retirement's a bad deal. 
retirement is a relatively new construct against the backdrop of history. There've always been people that have retired, but they retired typically from work when they could no longer do work. Our modern idea of retirement was altruistic. It was put in place really to help people transition out of a very labor-intensive lifestyle of the industrial age. In the 20th century, metastasized a bit with ageism to push older, more expensive workers out of the workforce. Yep. But it's not a good deal. The data constantly backs this, that if you leave work, you're more financially insecure. You don't really know how long you're going to live. You become sick on average, isolated. And these are all hyper problematic, but by staying in work and providing the pathways to allow people to stay in work connected to their workplace, we can solve for quite a bit of this. And we can actually see economic gains as a result. And you know, as our populations start to level off or in some cases reverse in terms of their total size and definitely within the labor market, having those extra workers are, are, are like a parachute into this new demographic era that that we should be taking advantage of. We shouldn't be ignoring it. So it took us 30 years to adjust to having retirement. Now it's going to take us 30 years to redefine and adjust to our I would say that we, we, start, we started a lot earlier in our readjustment than we may realize. I think by the early 1990s, at least in the United States, and you can see this in references in popular culture, movies, television, etc., there were already questions being raised about whether or not retirement was a good deal, whether or not Social Security could carry people for an extra 20, 30 years. Those questions were being raised in the 90s. Well, guess what? We're, we're at that mark now. We're at that 30-year mark. And what are we seeing? The data suggests across the board that older workers are marching back or staying in the workplace for longer periods of time. It's still slow and steady, but our attitudes have really changed. I think if you find a Gen Xer, for example, and you say, what do you think about retirement? What retirement is the answer? Same if you talk to a millennial or a Gen Z, the concept of the retirement that my grandparents had does not exist. It existed for about 30 years where people were relatively comfortable on a state pension, wonderful state health care. And a corporate pension. Don't forget about that corporate pension. That was a big part of the equation. And of course, they were the beneficiaries of a really, really healthy market, really expansive growth, and at least in this country, really significant growth in real estate where most people have most of their value. Yep. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the business of aging. And you and I are both kind of putting our toes into this, not only as a passion, but as our purpose. And how did you get into this? Give, give us a bit of your own backstory. Yeah. When did you first get interested in all? You've been in this for a long time. Long time. I'm 46. I have been in this for nearly, oh my God, <laughs> nearly 30 years. What got you involved as a young 20-year-old? It's, like, it's like everything. I get into it with my, because of my grandparents. Typically, people who get into aging... We get into it because of a loved one. We, we see some injustice levied against them. We see some type of fault in the, the way they're treated or, or the way that they're able to access healthcare yep. and long-term care. And that was my inflection point, was seeing what they were going through. People who had played by the rules across the board, retired in relative comfort, really excellent comfort considering they were both middle-class workers, and had the best of the best when it came to long-term care. And there were still massive gaps, massive gaps in their care. And I just became passionate about them first and foremost. But it was during my university years when I was traveling back and forth between Pittsburgh and Washington, D.C., which is my home now, where I was attending American University. And I drive into rural counties of Western Pennsylvania, and you'd see that the population there was really old. And they were mostly white. And they were working still. They were working. They were in low-wage jobs. And I couldn't jive in my mind at that time how this could be happening. My grandparents had retired. They put in their dues. They were following the social contract. They were the beneficiaries of the social contract. What was happening with these folks? Well, they weren't the beneficiaries of the social contract. They didn't have a corporate pension to fall back on. They didn't have great real estate investments. They needed to work to survive. And also, 
because there had been depopulation and population aging happening in rural counties, oh. there was a demand for them in the labor force. Yeah. There were jobs open for them that may yeah. not have been open for my grandparents because the market demanded it. And that's where, you know, I've spent most of my career focused on is understanding how these demographic changes interplay with our larger social, economic, and political norms. And then now helping businesses in particular really understand what the change means for their bottom line, where they can pivot either to producing more products and services for older adults, to becoming more inclusive and intentional in their design practices, whether that be in physical space or product and service design, or, you know, the baseline, are you hiring an age diverse workforce that actually matches what the rest of the country looks like? Because yeah. age is just as much as a part of diversity as, as somebody's race, or somebody's else. gender. Yeah. It's an essential component to building the best products and services and, and having the most successful company you can. So we're both pretty convinced and passionate about the business case for why companies might want to do this. But we've also been kind of scratching our heads and asking each other, are, are there enough companies that care for the number of consultants who want to convince them of it? You know, it's tough being the tip of the sphere. <laughs> I think we both, know, we both know that. Yeah. It's tough being the tip of the sphere. Because businesses first need to see that there's a problem or an opportunity before they start looking for solutions. And let's reverse back to the mid-century to give kind of an anecdote here on two different marketplaces. The first was the youth market. Yep. The second was the retiree market. In both markets, there were only about two or three real players that said to the world, hey, look at retirees. Hey, look at the youth market. And those people... and ended up being national names here, at least in the United States. Uh, Ethel Percy Andrus, who founded the AARP, which is the largest membership organization for over 50s in the world. The man that founded Sun City, the yep. pre-planned retirement community in Arizona. The guy who was the founder and CEO of Colonial Pen Insurance, which sold directly to older adults through AARP. On the other side with the youth market, the founder of Seventeen Magazine was the tip of the spear. So... I know there's a market there. You know there's a market there. It's taking time, though, for these big companies in particular to say, oh, we see it too. We see the value there. But they do exist. You and I both have a great client list at this point from big think tanks to multinational uh, NGOs and for-profits. They're there. But what will they make of it in the future? Will they be first to market like Pepsi Cola did in the 1950s when they hired the first black man to be part of their marketing team and lean into diversity as part of the business? Or will they resist it as other businesses have and not kept up with modern times? Change is the central story in humanity's course. And yeah. we're changing right now pretty quickly to becoming a society that is older than it's ever been with fewer younger people coming in the pipeline. So everything needs to readjust. And businesses are getting there. It's a little bit slower than I'd like, obviously, but it is happening. One of the rarely told benefits of being at the tip of the spear, as you call it, is at least you work with a lot of smart business leaders because they're the ones who see it first and move first. So the joys of being ahead is you work with some really great companies. Yeah, and I would say that probably the biggest challenge, I would say that anyone who's interested in the space who's, who's listening to this today, is that there are only a handful of business leaders that really get it. Yeah. And the ability for a big company to move relies heavily on their capital within that enterprise. So virtually every organization that has leaned into this well has had a transformational leader typically yeah. in their leadership class or above C-suite, who has said, this is the future. This kind of change is rarely accepted by people on the lower end of the yeah. rung. Absolutely. But those who are able to do it and do it well see great results, not only in their corporate performance, but they see great results in their own personal careers. And I think, Wait. you know, there's no greater story than the guy who said, we've got it, the guy at BMW who was head of HR for one plant in Big Dolphin, who said, we need to make this more age friendly. And he did it and he later became their COO. So there's a pathway for people who lean into change and it's quite lucrative. 
We had a great guest last season who, in France, who's gathered together 50 of the country's top CEOs to build a longevity charter. So some countries are really pulling the the leaders together to get this uh, on the leadership agenda, which I think is pretty enlightened. I hope we can spread that to a few more countries. Let me switch now to roadmaps. You say we each need a new roadmap for longevity, one that moves our horizons out. The problem is people really don't see that they're going to live longer than they're currently thinking. How do we right. how do we inject that realization more broadly? I don't think people necessarily need to think long term. They need to have a long term goal and then you do periodic tacking of the sails. I use the sailing analogy all the time. If you are a sailor, yep. I love sailing. I'm not, but I'll sail. tack along with you. you. You never sail in a straight line. You're yeah. always going, you always have an idea of where you're going, a destination. But as the winds change, as you go further along, your course may need to correct. Most people can't have a long-term mindset. We're not really built for that. We are built for survival mode, getting through the day. That's our biology. That's our evolution. So this modern concept of living long, where most of us live long, because there's always been old people. I want to make sure yeah. everyone's yeah. crystal clear on that. There's always been old people. They've always existed. They've always been successful in a later life. Some of them were doing their best work when they died, Michelangelo in particular, finishing yeah. the Sistine Chapel. But let's remember that for most people, this idea of a longevity is new, especially people in the working class. The chance of them getting to old age was, was rare. So I think people need to do periodic check-ins every two to three years. Where am I? What's my financial health look like? What's my physical health look like? Am I feeling that I am fulfilled in my career if I'm interested in a fulfilling career? How are my relationships? We know that that's a big component of longevity success are the health and strength of our relationships. Am I fulfilled by the people I'm around? Are they pushing me to do better and to do more? These are the little steps that people can take every day or every few years rather than saying, this is my 40-year plan. I'm just going to magically get there. So we're going to have to apply all of that kind of every so often tacking to work and careers as well and, and get ready to upskill and pivot more continuously. I was just talking earlier today to the OECD that's got this big report trying to encourage governments, companies, individuals to start thinking more about career mobility. But that, that's, that's also hard. How often are we going to, do you think, need to change careers? On average right now, I keep asking people how many times have they already changed. And you know, right so, now we're talking so two, different. three. Yeah, it's so different from where you are in the, what your generation is, when you were born, how often you've moved around. Loyalty tends to grow as people get older. But right now, you know, Gen Zs are bouncing. They're bouncing every like 18 to 36 months from a job. And so did we do that when we were in our 20s? I sure did. Hell no. Oh, yeah. Most people didn't. <laughs> Most people didn't. I mean, obviously, people had jobs they got into and they realized they weren't the right job for them, but then they went into something else and they, they stayed for five years or they stayed until they were vested in the corporate pension and then yeah. moved on, which was yeah. five to seven years, at least in the US. So, yeah, the contract has changed for these young people in so much they're in a tight labor market right now. Their skills, or at least their youth, is in high demand. And they have the flexibility to jump around a lot and find the best deal for them. Yeah. Now, there are managers that are pushing back on this. There was a survey that came out from Intelligent.com last year in December of 2023 that said like 38% of managers are really not happy with Gen Z workers. And in fact, 46% of them are looking into or are implementing benefits for mid and later career workers to retain them because they want to keep them. So what this is doing, this labor market is doing right now is it's forcing businesses to reconsider what talent looks like. You know, talent used to be, at least for most of the 20th century and, and almost all of the 21st century was a young person's game. If you're young, you got a job, yep. you can move around a lot. Now there's this readjustment. Some proactive companies, and there are quite a few of them exist, are saying, wait a second, look at this talent pool that we weren't considering before. Midlife 
midlife women in particular. We really hadn't thought about what they need. Let's pivot to helping people in their midlife transitions. And those companies that are doing it are receiving incredible praise. In fact, I, a piece came out that I wrote with Tamsa Vidal for Harvard Business Review just a few weeks ago on this subject, on how big companies in the US and the UK, with the UK really taking the lead, are leaning into this and, and making things better for their employees, building respect, building resilience, and building retention and yeah. even recruitment because when people see that those benefits are there, they start to see their business really as a, as a partner in their life, which is something we broke from in the 20th century. Business wasn't a partner in our life. They were part of our life. Now, I think this renegotiation is pulling us back into a more, I like to think, a more holistic relationship between the employer and the employee. That'd be nice. And I've been really appreciating the work that you've been doing on some of the gender differences in this time of life and the fact that so many women over 50 are leaving the workforce. What, what, right. are you, what have you been seeing and what are some of these innovative companies doing on the retention I mean, there, front? There's there such a weird thing happening right now with the labor market from a U.S. perspective. So let me give you, give yep. you that. The first part is, is that women now are earning, when they enter the workforce, are earning at or above what men are making. This is almost a universal truth in major metropolitan areas. When you go out into rural areas, it becomes a bit more imbalanced. But as a near universal truth, women are earning as much or more than men when they enter the workforce now. That is insane. That has completely changed the game. Women in midlife- It's, it's, about, it's about time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no, de no denying it. They're better educated. They're better uh, educated. Yep. That's yeah. I mean, they, and this is pre-children, right? We got to note. This is pre-children. So this is, where, this is where the proverbial wheels come off the bus. Yep. When women have their first child, they receive their first penalty from their employer. And this is a missed promotion. This might be passed over for work or big projects because they're balancing both work and life in a different way. As women enter middle age, they're confronted by two realities, two big realities. The first being that they're not only the caregivers for their children, if they've had them, they also become the primary caregivers for their adult parents. So that creates- Why is that? Don't, don't men have parents? What's, what's you know, the, I, and men are I, I can, more of the slack now. I mean, the data suggests that both, both, both male children and male grandchildren are picking up more of the slack as it relates to the caregiving responsibilities. But still predominantly today, women are carrying the burden of yeah. that. And I say it's a burden not because it isn't just work and it isn't just actions to take care of your loved ones, but it does hit you um, in your professional development and it does hit you in your pocketbook in a big way because there are lots of unforeseen hidden costs that come with being an informal caregiver. Yep. And then, of course, you know, a large number of women in middle age experience menopause. And some of the symptoms can be quite dramatic. And I don't see, say dramatic in that pejorative term, more that they manifest in ways that can really impact job performance. And that's what the research has shown is that Brain fog becomes a real thing. The inability to sleep through the night becomes a real thing. These all start to impact the way, way women show up in the workplace and the way they're perceived in the workplace. And that creates another ding. For those companies, though, that are able to help women navigate, as, as the CEO of Care and Fertility says, navigate their fertility journey. They look at it as an entire continuum of fertility businesses are actually better prepared to not only deliver on a health promise to their workforce, treating these women as assets for their time at the office, but also help mitigate some of the risk associated with it, particularly men not really understanding what's going on. When those things come together, though, we start to see better outcomes. And trust me, businesses would not be doing these things if it wasn't saving them or making them money. Like, that's what business does. They're not doing this out of the goodness of their heart. They're doing this because it actually improves output. Well, and I, th I think a lot of them are also recognizing that these decades, if uh, they get and keep female talent into their 50s and get through some of these journey points that you're talking about, they get some of women's best career decades, most impactful, really, most knowledgeable, most really, experienced really, years. Really, really 
top notch workers because it's almost built into the essence of womanhood is resilience, getting through tough stuff, dealing with pain, figuring out how to get to make it work. And I think when you overlay that with the advancements of education, the ability to pivot when something hits you the wrong way, and what people like to call soft skills, but actually really hard skills, the ability to communicate, converse, find solutions, women tend to do those better than men, right? Men are task-oriented, skills-oriented. Women are a bit more prepared for what the modern economy and the modern workforce is doing today. This is just a norm. This isn't stereotyping here. But when you see how the workforce has evolved, women are able to do more with it today. They're not using brute strength to make machines. They're thinking about innovative solutions to build a better product or service. And I'm just curious, what, what do you think men's journey through midlife and on is? How, is it complimentary? Is it's it silent and it's sad. And it's very difficult. I mean, women's superpower. We hear, be, we hear a lot about menopause. What's men's equivalent? Do, well, do we talk do about andropause? Men do experience a type yeah. of menopause. Male menopause is a real thing. It's, yeah. it's a lot slower. It doesn't hit in kind of a five to 10 year period. It happens over a 20 or 30 year period where men slowly lose testosterone. They lose their virility. They lose their energy. Like it happens over time. Women, though, tend to have better social networks. So there's greater support if they want it. Men do not have the same level of, of social supports. I think men in general are facing a bit of a crisis right now. What's their role in society? And I think you can see this showing up in some of the nationalist movements within countries. Yep. Yep. I think that there's a real frustration among men because they don't know where they fit anymore in society. The machines are doing a lot of the jobs that they did at a good union wage. Those are gone. Those are done by a machine now. And, you know, the re- I say this a thousand times over. There's a few skills that are really necessary for the future. And they are resilience, time and time again. Creativity, though, curiosity, and compassion. If you're able to have those three C's as a worker, I think you're meeting the future head on. Because... If I'm ever interviewing somebody and they show those skills, I don't care if they have that hard skill of knowing how to make a really great deck in PowerPoint or, you know, engineer a new product. I need those other things first and foremost. And skills-based hiring, I think, is going to sunset. Not entirely, but it's going to start to sunset soon because we need people who are adaptable in our workplaces, especially if we're investing in them because we have to. For longer periods, we have to just have those a lot of the a lot of the people attracted to a lot of this midlife MOT type work or midlife transition work tend to be more women. Men are a lot more shy or embarrassed or ashamed about coming out. I would say on some of the complexities and turbulence of transitions. What do you think yeah, we could do to help them? Should we be helping them? Why well, are we focusing yes. on? <laughs> we should because the lack of participation. Yeah. does create social, political, yeah. and economic rifts. Yeah. And without having pathways for folks, men in particular who are mid to later life, we're alienated a whole class of people. They're not included in the DEI conversations at all. At all, um, they're excluded. I mean, they're willful. Hyper, hyper excluded. Hyper excluded. Uh, and actually yeah. blamed for a lot of the current uh, yeah. realities. And that's, that's really bad when we have an us versus them yeah. attitude. Perhaps the pendulum might be rebalancing where men are brought in to that conversation. That would be one thing that we should consider doing. The other thing is, I think, getting folks just to have open conversations about what it means. I mean, not the touchy-feely stuff because men don't tend to go for that. No, but what do they want to do with the next decade of their What careers? do you want to do when you grow up? Like, yeah, exactly. I ask that question all the time. I mean, I know it sounds a bit reductive to say it, but like, when you're done growing up, you're done. Yeah. People need to realize that every year is, it should be a gift to some degree. But more importantly, having a plan or at least thinking about how your life looks and how it could be improved, we should all be doing that. I mean, I do that naturally. 
And maybe that's a superpower, but you know, there are times in life. It is a superpower. So companies should be doing this, right? I mean, it's typical younger to have these regular uh, conversations about future and things like that. But generally what's happening inside organizations is post 50, those conversations are not happening. What, there's just a general problem with companies like to talk about the future. Companies don't always like to act on the future. That's one of the big disconnects is that yeah. companies are motivated by one thing, and that's a quarterly earnings report. And companies make short-term decisions as a result. Now, of course, you have visionary leaders that can manage the both ends of that, the quarterly earnings and where the future, what the future holds. But those leaders are exceptional, and they are few and far between. That's why when a company decides it needs to improve its, its revenues, it, it's, it slices people from the staff. And they tend to be yeah. people who are higher income, yeah. are, are higher earners, which tend to be older workers. And then they lose all that institutional knowledge, they lose all that expertise, and then they're actually behind where they were before, yeah. even though their balance sheet looks good. So businesses at some point need to reconsider whether that quarterly earnings report is the best way to be operating. Should we look annual? Should we look every three years? This would get us to a more longer term strategy for these companies. So they're not hit with the reality of one day waking up and saying, oh, geez, we have to make an entire different product because we weren't considering these changes five years ago when they were brought to our attention, these demographic changes. And we've seen companies be hit by that. It just kind of so you've you've been saying that you know the HR function in most organizations is becoming much more aware of these things. Whereas who's not getting the script? <laughs> HR managers, I would say for the most part, are aware. Yeah, they're aware at least. I would say there's some diversity in how well they're embracing it and understand it. They're confronted by let's say three realities. The first is that people who are applying for jobs don't necessarily understand the application process. So the way you write a resume today is vastly different than the way you wrote a resume three years ago. Really different than five years ago, almost alien to 10 years ago. If you have somebody who's changing a job after a decade, they're going to have a hard time navigating that. So they're going into a system that tends to sort based on keyword. And sometimes by experience too. Like... That's a problem. So the sorting hat and the getting into the sorting hat are the two first two things that are challenged here. The last thing, though, tends to be the hiring manager. The actual hiring manager seems to be where a lot of the problem is. You know, we're talking about people 35 to 45, mostly privileged, you know, high, high education, high income. They're looking to hire people that are like them. Like, it takes an effort to hire for diversity. It's work. Yeah. It's even harder for for some reason, when it comes to age. And part of that is that we do have some ingrained thinking about seniority. Can I really talk to a person and work with a person who's older than me? Can they be a subordinate to me in my, in my office, in my enterprise? That's a bit of a misconception, I think. But more so, there is this nagging bias around ageism that the older adult that you might be hiring isn't up to date on skills, doesn't have the ground fundamental understanding of the way the workplace actually functions, can't get along across generations, yada, yada, yada. Again, highly problematic. First of all, the data doesn't support that. But more often, you have to realize that if you've met one older worker, you've just met one older worker. Like It's just like anyone else you'd hire. But that mask that we wear, you know, the wrinkles, the grays, et cetera, they are a huge barrier to entry because of the bias of younger people. And I, you know, I'm sure you're the same way. I get a call once every other week. Somebody who says, I need your help. Well, I, I, I can tell you what you should do, but I can't move that person, that hiring manager. Yeah. And you know, in fact, our uh, Marketplace, which is a national public radio show here in the United States, just featured a woman who reached out to me four months ago, Amy Claire Massingale, in a story about older workers. And she was told, much like most of them are when they get to that final interview, we just think you're overqualified. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. The kiss of death. It's not a real thing. I mean, she was, she persevered. She did the, she did the hard work. She re-skilled, re-upped the way she was applying, talked to the right career coaches. She did everything possible and eventually landed a job that she's happy with. But 
that is tenacity. And I don't yeah. think most people are built for that, that, yeah. that, that kind of headwind they're going to hit. They're not expecting it enough. So, so the next question is, where should this longevity topic sit in companies? I mean, there's a lot of calls to add ageism to the DNI agenda, but I don't think that's going to do it. Do you? No, I think the market is going to move most of this at the yep. end of the day. We're seeing that incremental change already in the U.S. Over 65s will grow by 25% roughly in the next 10 years. Over 75s will grow by about 100% while the under 24s will actually have negative growth uh, grow yep. by about a negative, I think, 8%. So we're going to see a natural transition to older adults staying or being recruited into the workforce. And what we'll see is if you have those proactive managers, and they do exist, there's plenty of them out there. If they're able to really harness the skills, my friend and colleague, Megan Gerhardt, calls it gen intelligence, how to get the most out of the, the generations that are in the workplace, leveraging their hard and soft skills to the benefit of the company, really good products and services are developed as a result. And that to yeah. me is, that's the goal here. Yeah. Because it isn't just the labor market that's shifting. Here. Absolutely. It's the consumer market <laughs> it's as well. It's the consumer well. markets. Yeah. And boomers do have quite a bit of wealth right now. On average, there are very poor boomers, there are very rich boomers, and there are average boomers. But as a generation, they are wealthy. They are going to want products and services for them that are specific to their needs. But I'm placing a bet, and it's a pretty significant bet, that they want to be included in the products and services that are currently offered. They want to have spaces that they can go into and feel comfortable in, despite the fact that they may be carrying a disability. They want to work in places that are comfortable, that think about the whole of the human condition, not just about a prime age, quote unquote, prime age worker. They want to feel comfortable in these places. Those businesses that adapt, and I think we've got well, I know we've got, we've got nearly 20 years of data on this, of companies that have made these small adjustments and have seen significant financial returns. We now have a whole, a whole library of case studies yeah. that we can show. And not just in one industry. That's the best part. It's yeah. not just one industry. We're talking about everything from automotive to heavy industrial to retail to clothing. All of them are making these adjustments. And the ones that do man, they are doing incredibly well now. Yeah, because it's a win for everyone. Everybody wins. They're so poised but for this wave. You know, in this country, in the United States, 2024 is peak 65. 11,000 people a day turning 65. That remakes the math on everything. I'm not the firmest believer in the longevity economy as it's designed, but I am a believer in the fact that there are more older adults than ever and they are not interested in pursuing the same path of retirement that their parents did. Yeah. Yep. No, it's the big generational break, right? Yeah. It's a huge generational break. Yeah. We've never seen anything quite like this. So we're all kind of pioneers in redefining Perfect. what this new Q3 is going to look like. So let's conclude with one piece of advice. If you had only one thing to tell companies who are listening to start implementing, what would it be? There isn't a country on the planet that isn't aging today. Not a one. Our birth rates may differ, and they differ substantially from places like Korea and China where the birth rate is below run to sub-Saharan Africa where it's nipping at seven, but all births are down. So companies do need to consider a long-term longevity strategy if they're going to expand their customer base, if they're going to expand their market share. If you maintain the status quo of only focusing on 18 to 35s, you will get trounced by your competition, period. Yeah. Or what's more likely to happen in the short term is you're going to start to see your profits dwindle because there are just fewer people to purchase. So get your longevity strategy on the books. Not just a longevity strategy, a demographic strategy. A understand demographic where strategy. populations are, understand where they're going. Once you realize that, a longevity strategy comes right along. It's yeah. a natural, a natural place for you to go. But you have to understand population shifts to yeah. really be able to lean into this. If you don't believe in population change, you can't be ready for the future. You can't be ready for today, yeah. but you can't be ready for the future. And that's where companies need to get. That's that first hurdle. 
And then wrapping into longevity strategy, no matter how you define it, is that next natural leap. Do we do what they did in Japan? Move from building diapers to building incontinence products seemingly overnight? Or are we thinking more smartly about what the future may bring? Are we thinking like Apple? Are we thinking like Apple computers that builds products that are natu- almost naturally inclusive of people of varying ages and abilities? Apple's the company of the future. More companies should be like them. Okay. And one last piece of advice for an individual listening. What's the Apple individual of the future? I think the person of the future is ultimately curious. But like I say, those three C's are fundamental in meeting the future head on. Creativity, curiosity, and compassion. Those skills are nearly impossible to learn. But if you have them, man, you are poised. You are poised, both as an individual, but also a leader within a company. If you've got them, you've got the goods. Bradley, thank you so much for your curious, compassionate, and very creative conversation today. It's been a delight. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank game. you. Thanks for having me. Until the next curve hits. For more thinking about the impact of our four quarter lives, you can read my column at Forbes and subscribe to my Elderberries newsletter on Substack. Let's design lives that aren't just longer, but better. <laughs>